Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Grumman Pilots YouTube channel. Today we're talking about a Grumman Tiger engine out emergency landing. Funny, I was on my way home back to Ohio to have the engine overhauled, and uh, it didn't make it that far. So stay tuned for a little bit of that tale and the bits and pieces we took out. We would like to ask you please subscribe, hit the like button, and hit the notify to stay current with our content. So I was coming back, and uh, the first day, not a problem, flew all across uh, one of the Idaho mountains, was going direct to uh, Dermopolis, and it was when I was climbing through 14,000 feet that I just, something just didn't feel right, and I just said, you know, I'm going to divert down to Rock Springs for fuel, because I want to get in flatter land. And I went down to Rock Springs, took on fuel from Rock Springs to Valentine, Nebraska, hot afternoon. Late September, I figured, oh, my oil temperature's a little up, my oil pressure's a little low, it's a hot day, I'm up hot. Okay, no big deal. Landed at Valentine, checked my oil. I was a half quart down, but I hadn't checked it in a while. I run at six and a half, I was at six, no big deal. Popped it off at six and a half in the morning at Valentine, dropped in fuel, took off, uh, went up to my normal cruise altitude to stay out of the heat of the day, you know, 9,500, 11,500. Got up there, got the cruise, and looked over and went, why is my oil temperature high? It was cool. And my oil pressure was still a little low. And I said, well, I'll have it looked at when I get home. What the heck? Maybe it didn't like I have. And as I landed at Muscatine, which is the Pearl Button capital of the world, Iowa, I picked on fuel. I'm two hours now out of home. I took off. It was in the departure. Oh, and I added a quart of oil. And I went, why did I use a quart of oil? Well, I didn't know. So I said, well, you know, get home, Itis. One of those five rules that'll get you killed. So I jumped in the airplane and I took off. Now my oil pressure was not as high on runoff as it normally is. And I looked at it and said, well, okay, it's in the green. It's not where it should be, but what the heck did that, you know, Wycombe builds a lot of tolerance in their stuff. So it was in the climb out, and I was doing a gradual climb out to keep things cool, running a little extra fuel to it to keep it cool. But at 4,700 feet, I was scanning around for traffic when I felt the engine ooh, roll back. And I went, what? And I looked over. And oil pressure was pegged, and the an oil temperature was pegged all the way over the red line, and the pressure was doing this. <laughs> and I okay, I leveled out, throttled back, punched nearest GPS, 12.7 miles airport. Okay, I can make that. So I started heading for Galesburg, uh, Illinois. Uh, needless to say, about four miles out, I started hearing valve. At that point, the oil pressure got to zero. About 10 seconds after that. I went, this is not bad. I had a choice at that point of two roads. One with traffic, power lines and trees, and then a gravel road out of glide range between soybean fields. And I figured, well, what the heck, I can always take the soybean field. At this point, I'm thinking, I can feather the engine, just shut it down, land on the road. Okay, but then I might ding up the frame. So I said, that's it. And then when the valve tap had started in, I said, that's it. I'm going to go for the other road. I just gave everything forward. Bought me 20, 20 seconds of thrust. The prop actually stopped at about three places. It took, 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 took the airplane over, did my emergency check, set up on the road, and I went ahead and went downwind first. And couldn't figure out why the flaps were not coming down, and nobody was talking in the radio. Master's off. Turned it back on. Galesburg Unicom, Tiger 23 Julie Keel, making emergency landing on the road approximately 3.7 northwest, landing to the west. 23 Julie Keel, no problem. Shut down. Dropped the flap, landed on the road, and walked. A lot like landing in Alaska for those of you who've been there. You land on gravel. Not a problem. I'm glad I didn't choose the soybean field because halfway through my landing roll, there was a gully about 20 feet deep, and that would have been real bad. So I landed on the roll. I did roll one arrow on to avoid a big pothole, but I landed on this gravel road, jumped out of the airplane with the fire stinger, popped open the cow for fire, and there was nothing because when the engine stopped, a big puff of white smoke. It came in through the vents, very disconcerting, but it went right away, and I went, okay, no fire. Well, great, great deal. Got it on the ground. Put the fire extinguisher away, walked around to the front, looked around, and then your heart starts to pound. Then your knees get wobbly. <laughs> Car comes down the road. You okay? Yeah. My wife said, your airplane was really quiet. And I said, you know, his propeller is not moving, honey. That's <laughs> <laughs> okay. Which, which I was at that point. One day. So, a couple of minutes later, a Cessna comes out of the airport and starts circling around. 
And I'm trying to get on the radio telling the system, okay, what I didn't notice was I landed at 75 miles an hour on a, on a shell road, white shell. There was white, what appeared to be white smoke just bleeding across the field. As soon as the Cessna spotted the smoke, aircraft on fire, aircraft down, roll. No, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And not listening. About three minutes later, sirens. <laughs> and at that point it was, I can't tell you what order it was, but the final count was five sheriffs, because I was right on the edge of two counties, <laughs> two state troopers, two ambulances, local cops. First thing the ambulance does is we need to, you know, we need to check your blood pressure. My numbers were a little high, my heart rate's a little fast. She goes, do you have high blood pressure? <laughs> Are you a trained EMT? I, I just had an emergency landing. What's your name? Dr. Henry Roche. <laughs> well, would you like to see a doctor? I have, I'm fine. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> So that was fine. They took the information, I signed it. As I walked out of the ambulance, the next group of we got we gotta examine you. No, you can go get a photocopy of my paperwork. <laughs> Sheriff walked up, wanted to examine my you know. I did find out later that if they did want, I mean, they really could have seen my pilot's license if they wanted. I was wrong and I told him there was no intention to fly. He could have examined my pilot's license. But he didn't know that and it all worked out okay. <laughs> so, half an hour after all this is over, the only thing the state trooper wanted was me to move the airplane to a gate hole. So he said, we got lots of people here. And I said, well, I want to pick them. Because I had all these guys ready to just grab the airplane and move it. And they're grabbing, you know, uh, rudder, Elevator, elevator, no, no, don't push the airplane. I said, you, you, and you. You on the wingtip, you on the wingtip, you with me on the prop. And we pulled it down the road and backed it into a bait hole off the gravel road for the farm traffic. After we got there, they looked around. They said, do you need anything? No, I'm fine. So one sheriff walked up and said, the FDAA at Galesburg would like to talk to you. I pocket. So they all go away. So now, it's now 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It's a half an hour after my emergency landing, and I'm all alone in the middle of nowhere with soybean fields. <laughs> but they just left me there with the airplane. Now, one farmer did come up and asked that I need to ride to town. I said, no, I have an ice chest. I've got a case of wine, 60 pounds of cheese. And I, was <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I was not worried for provisions. I had food, I had drink. Like Claude, I picked up the phone. Hi, Len. <laughs> I'm not going to be home tonight on time. Um, me and the plane are fine. We're just on the ground. And I'll be called, I'll call the mechanic. Then I called my mechanic and said, you need to come pick me up in the truck. I'm, on, I'm in Galesburg. I'll call you later and tell you right where. Went to the GPS, got a GPS location, wrote that down, sat down and wrote out everything I could remember of the emergency and put it on paper. Having nothing to do now, I said, well, I didn't do anything. I'm going to call the FAA. I called the FAA Galesburg and he listened to what I had to say. It was fine. Just please call the Galesburg in Springfield. So I called the Galesburg in Springfield. And the guy kept me on the phone for like 45 minutes, on hold, on back, where my cell phone battery went. But he finally said, okay, well, we'll be in touch with you later. Greg, Greg, did you call Greg and me? Talked to Greg and me, I think it was my phone was dying. You know, and then my corporate phone was dying. So, didn't know where you were. Yeah, and didn't know where I was. So when I finally did, the UPS guy came by, I said, where am I? And he told me right where I was, the name of the street, and I took the GPS coordinates, I put them into Microsoft Streets and Map, and I knew right where I was, so that I could get tonight, the next night, people to get right to me. And then the locals started coming by. They go, well, we heard about the airplane crash, it will take me to me, I've never seen one. <laughs> and then the other group of people would point the airplane, you know there's an airport just right over there. <laughs> well, yeah, that's where I was trying to get <laughs> So we had we had a lot of curiosity seekers on. Uh, so my mechanic said, well, "Why don't you do me a favor? Why don't you start taking the airplane apart for the trailer? I've done this many a time." So I pull out my toolbox, wing tips off, start loosening brackets. I had nowhere to put the fuel, and I didn't want to dump 46 gallons of fuel into a ditch. So I left all the fuel lines, and I didn't have the tools for the tail. So when the farmer came by and said, "Well, is there anything I can do for you? Do you need something to eat?" And I said, "I've got plenty of food." Could you charge my cell phone? Could you bring me a 38 inch and a 7 16 and a 9 16 He would be happy to get the tail off. He said, there he goes, well, it didn't take long to do that at all. <laughs> nope, did. got all that. He brought me two beers when I finished that. Oh, I brought oh. back my cell phone. And now I've got really nothing to do. No cell phone to talk on. Finally, one of the emergency people came back because he wanted to show his wife a crash site. <laughs> <laughs> he says, is there anything we can get you? I said, well, the bugs are starting to get kind of bad. It's summer. Could you bring me some cigars or something to smoke to keep your butts out? So I basically hung around until 
1.45 in the morning when they arrived. And they're going, where are you? I said, I got the beacon on. Just turn on this road on the first ground and on the left. <laughs> well, my life is off streets and maps is wonderful. I'm going, okay, you're on I-74. Get off at the main street exit. Go on. I mean, I, I talked them right in. Uh, also, while I was sitting there, I had nothing to do. So before daylight ended, I inventoried from the military. You know, when you got inventory your resources, I inventoried everything I had in the airplane. Then I had all these control servers. Okay, if I were crashed in Idaho, how would I build a shelter? So I tried all the different ways of like putting the um, the tail section against the back of the wing and using other pieces to try to build a little shelter under the wing. I tried laying down on the canopy cover under the wing in the grass to get some sleep, waiting for them. But the people kept coming by and talking to you. And what are you going to say? You know, hi. Yeah, no, that was the first time for me too. <laughs> a lot of fun. When we got the air, we got the airplane home. And we began to look at what had actually come. We knew we had a loss of pressure. We knew we had thrown a connecting rod because when I popped the cowling, this is what I saw. The end of a connecting rod sticking up. Well, I would, but here we go. Oh, my. Oh, okay. oh, oh, hold on. It gets better. So we saw that. And there was a whole black oil everywhere. And it was, and then some of the oil was gray. And we went, oh, it must have been making metal maybe a little bit. So that's what we saw first. I said, I threw a connecting rod. No big deal. And I thought all the oil had come out of there. That explained the white smoke on the exhaust. As we began to disassemble the case, in the, whoops, in the bottom of this one, you'll notice that there's a ding here. When we pulled the case off, this piece of the connecting rod was beat into the case, literally as part of the case. Couldn't pry it out. We eventually hammered it out. As we got it apart, we saw the other part of the mythology. Uh -oh. A little lightning hole to speed mark. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the airplane sitting next to the soybean fields in Galesburg, Illinois, waiting for my ride back to the hangar, which showed up in the wee hours of the morning. But we did take it back to the hangar, and then we were able to take the engine off, and we were able to pull the engine all apart and see all the bad bits that were inside the engine. Now these photos are going to go by fairly quickly, but we had bits and pieces that we grabbed everywhere we could. We couldn't retrieve it all. We left some of it somewhere, but we had holes in the engine. We had pieces embedded in the case. There was debris everywhere. And the net effect of this engine out was that there was not a single piece of that engine that was usable as a core. So that we were going to have to buy an all new engine um, from scratch because we didn't have a core anymore. So that's the net effect when you have something like that. The crankshaft wasn't good. The camshaft wasn't good. The case wasn't good. Again, nothing was left. So it was quite a catastrophic event. So ladies and gentlemen... Keep that in mind, um, you know, I sacrificed the engine to save the airframe. So we hope you found all this useful and informative about an emergency engine out. Hope you never have one. Thank you so much for watching and have a great day flying your Grumman.